Thanks. So yeah, I'm Andy Francis. I'm the technical content lead at Bitmovement. Uh, today, I'm going to share some experience from two previous employers around two very different live streaming workflows that had issues that ended up having a similar root cause. Um, title was a bit of a spoiler there, but let's get into it. So first, some quick background to set the stage. IDR stands for Instantaneous Decoding Refresh. Uh, what does that actually mean? What do they do? Well, if an IDR frame is received, the decoder is instantaneously reset and all of the frame buffers and other internal buffers are cleared out. Um, they're not dependent on any other frames for decoding, so they serve as random access points within a stream. And they also provide some error resilience as a clean starting point for the decoder to recover from errors or packet loss upstream. So when are they inserted? Well, periodically, often to start off a group of pictures or segments, depends a bit on your uh, keyframe interval and gap size, but that's usually the case. Uh, they can also be inserted dynamically uh, based on um, events or signals within the source stream. One of the most common use cases is around scene change detection. Um, especially if you're in the middle of a gap when a camera switch happens, inserting an IDR frame makes sure that the frames that follow have a clean reference point to decode from and aren't giving you any residual artifacts for the next few seconds um, that might be noticeable by the user. Another common use case is around SCSI 35 markers. Um, these are used to trigger ad insertion or slates or alternate content, so basically a, a programmatic content switch. So here, the IDR frames serve the same kind of purpose of providing that clean transition point um, in between content. So the first thing I'm going to talk about here is uh, back all the way to 2011, I was working for a platform called Ustream. Um, we were the live platform for Samsung Galaxy S2 launch. It was a three-day live stream where they actually attached a uh, the phone and a camera and a transmitter to a massive balloon, let that go into space, and then the viewers could tweet at their handle and they would see their name and their message up in outer space. And uh, they have some, some good videos on their YouTube channel there. And I'll point out in the, um, the thumbnail in the video here, you see the RF antenna they were using to receive the signal on the ground. So here's a high-level overview of the signal path, you know, RF from the balloon down to the ground. That was fed into a satellite truck, which beamed the signal back up into space, over to a downlink facility. There they were doing the H.264 encoding and sent that as RTMP to Ustream. And then we were doing some ABR transcoding and repackaging for the viewers at home. And this mostly worked pretty well, but um, since I'm talking about it, you already know there were some issues. So what we were seeing on the player side, there was some freezing and some rebuffering. Uh, sometimes the content was jumping ahead. Um, sometimes there was some segments that were being replayed. Um, and this wasn't happening all the time. It was coming and going seemingly with no real obvious pattern or correlation to anything, at least at first. Looking on the ingest side, we were seeing input buffer under, underruns on the Flash Media server. There was packets arriving way late, way out of order. And it basically looked like any time we'd see a Ustream user that was uh, trying to stream at a bit rate that was too high for their upload bandwidth. At the downlink facility, they were seeing that satellite connection was locked and solid the entire time. But on their encoder, they were getting some uh, flash throughput congestion alarms every now and then. And this was a facility where you know, they had multiple events going on at the same time, so they had a really tightly managed network. Um, the target bit rate for this Samsung stream was I think 650 kilobits per second. So they had allocated a circuit with two megabits per second of upload bandwidth dedicated to that encoder. Should have, in theory, been enough. Um, but then looking at the output bit rate from the encoder, it was something like this, this is a recreation, but for the most part, it was you know, hovering between 650 and one megabit per second. But then there was these periods where 
it was uh, spiking and then slamming up against that two megabit per second um, allocation they had. And we'll come back to this in a second. So as you might imagine, the RF link from outer space down to the ground wasn't entirely 100% solid the whole time. Um, we would get some static hits. Sometimes the signal would cut out briefly. Um, you know, the, as the balloon traveled, they would need to redirect that antenna on the ground to maintain a solid link. But what we finally realized was when there was a prolonged period of these full frame static RF hits, what was happening was the scene change detection on the encoder at the downlink facility was getting triggered and it was inserting IDR frames, sometimes quite a few in a short period of time. So that was what was causing the bit rate to spike up and hit that um, limit they had set. So then we would, there was packets being retransmitted and that was what was causing all the sort of funkiness that we were seeing on the Ustream ingest side. So the resolution here, this is, like I said, this is a three day event. Um, so we were just disabled scene change detection for the rest of it. And then we also raised the minimum quantization factor to help keep that output bit rate a little bit closer to the set target, it just as another safeguard. So then jumping ahead a few years, I was working for BAM Tech Media. This was in 2017. Um, we were contracted by a large VOD service that was getting into the live linear space to handle the signal acquisition and stream normalization for their live content. And a quick shout out here to Zachary Kava from Disney Streaming. Did a great talk at DMUX a few years ago about uh, live ad insertion for OTT workflows. So, um, he said something there that I thought was a good intro for this section which is when you want to do ad insertion, of course, you need to know where the ads are. And to support that, we actually have a thing called SCUDI 35. This is a very common specification. There are some people that wince when you say it. I am one of those people that winces at the mention of SCUDI 35. Um, and this next case was one of the many reasons why. So this was another high level rough overview of the signal path. This was right along the time when we were sort of transitioning from doing the live acquisition over the traditional broadcast methods of satellite and dedicated fiber paths and starting to do everything end to end over the network. So using things like Zixi and um, similar technologies to acquire the, the sources over the public internet. Then our operations team would do some QC, do some PID normalization, so our automation system and our encoders would always know which PIDs to look at for the video and audio and SCUDI markers. Then we do some ABR transcoding with IDR frames at the SCUDI markers and package that as HLS and DASH for the service that would then do their own ad insertion workflows and handle the application side. So the situation that came up, we were bringing up a new batch of these local network affiliate stations. And soon after starting the encoders, one of them crashed. Uh, taking a quick look at the log, so there was a lot of SCUDI markers right before the crash. Um, so we had had a lot of quirks and issues with around decoding of these inputs, uh, of these new workflows, especially when SCUDI markers were involved. So. Our protocol at the time was to start a capture of the source and then restart the encoders on a new machine. So not long after that, the new encoder also crashed. We took a look at the capture in our analyzer and saw that there were splice insert messages uh, corresponding to every single frame for four full seconds. So doing some quick math there, that meant there was 120 SCUDI 35 markers and IDR frames being inserted over a four second span. The encoder um, basically just could not handle that uh, and crashed in a way that wasn't recoverable without a hard reboot. So the next step was to get in touch with the station, let them know what we were seeing. Got the station engineer on the phone and it's like, yeah, we're seeing these splice inserts on every frame for four full seconds. And the response was basically, um, 
yeah, that's our workflow. Our, our gear handles it fine. What's wrong with your gear? Um, which I can't totally blame them for, but luckily we had a good relationship with our encoding vendor. We were able to share the capture with them and they were able to add some safeguards and enhanced logic to their SCSI processing. So we'd only get one IDR frame inserted when we'd get these bursts of markers. So the lessons learned I'm hoping to leave you with, uh, sometimes even a best practice like IDR frame insertion on scene change detection or with SCSI markers can create unexpected problems. Uh, test as early and as close to the production workflow as you can. And even when there's a defined spec, there might be different interpretations and implementations out there that you need to be a little flexible and adapt around for a common solution. Thank you.